So uh, my name is Evgeny. Uh, I'm the CEO of Zero Turnaround. Uh, I tend to talk about weird things like class orders and uh, memory. And today I'm going to talk about continuous delivery, uh, but in a very um, pragmatical way. I'm not going to talk at all about any methodology. I'm just going to talk about, you know, how do you actually build yourself a uh, continuous delivery pipeline uh, using tools like Jenkins, Nexus, and Liveable. So, if you don't know the company Zero Turnaround, then you know we're pretty well known for our tool Jarable, uh, which helps uh, developers around the world uh, be more productive by uh, speeding up the feedback cycle. So you can just edit your application, you know, in the in the ID and see their results immediately in the in the web browser. And uh, you know we have we, we quite. It's used by quite a few people, so if you haven't heard about it, then definitely should give it a try. But otherwise, it's fairly irrelevant to our talk today. So um, what, what I want to talk about is kind of like a very nicely, very nice process. And as an example, I want to kind of bring the FedEx process, where the packages are actually packaged, dropped off, transferred, delivered, and well, at some point paid for as well, I hope, we hope. Or at least FedEx hopes, because otherwise they're not very happy. But uh, the important part is that every single step in that uh, process is trackable, and if something goes wrong, it's always recoverable, right? So every step is trackable, every failure is recoverable, and, that's, and they spend a lot of time building that process. So, and you know, if you look at the kind of Java E, this uh, packaging, building, and deploying pipeline, then it's kind of the same. You package, you know, well, you test, you approve. You deploy, you profit, but uh, for some reason, you know, everybody complains that it's not quite as uh, not quite as smooth as the FedEx one. So there are always failures. There's always issues. You know, the production goes down. The ops are unhappy. The devs are unhappy. You know, everybody's blaming each other. But somehow, somehow, it's much harder uh, to build a predictable pipeline for deploying an application. Than it is for developing and deploying an application than it is for the for FedEx for delivering packages. So um, you know, and you get the, the, one of the reasons for that is uh, is that Java E, uh, you know, and generally software building and deploying software is significantly more complex uh, than actually the FedEx project. And you know, if, if you just just start looking into just a few questions like uh, how do you package uh, the application? Where does it come from? Where does it go? What steps does it come in between? Who touches it? Uh, what exactly gets deployed and how? Uh, what exactly is in production? So there, there's, you know, if you just start going to any company and start asking those questions, and then you know, you, uh, then you get very different answers depending on people you talk to. Uh, you get very different answers depending on organizations you talk to. You get very different answers even depending, you know, in the same team, like depending sometimes who you talk to. So I've done like a, a few hundreds of such interviews, and it was always. What what the most interesting thing what I found from them is that there's very little rhyme and reason reason uh, to how these things happen. Like it's very very different. Like it's it's the best that people can come up with. So uh, and you know and another reason why uh, why software is kind of harder to do than FedEx is that you know this is the FedEx fail right. So this uh, some some packages you know are in that car. It's, they'll get recovered. They'll get put on another bus. You know, and they'll just get delivered a little bit later. At the very worst, you know, what can happen to FedEx is that a FedEx plane falls, and basically all the packages are lost, right? And, you're, and insurance pays them out, right? In software, so the, more or less the worst that usually the worst that happens is you get your package tomorrow. Usually it's delay, and there's a very, very, very slight, uh, slight uh, probability that you actually won't get your package, but you'll get the money. Uh, and so, so the scope, so the failure probability is fairly low. And the failure impact is fairly low. Uh, this is software, right? So this is what happens when software fails. And the problem with software is that it's entirely unlike almost any uh, physical objects. It has very high probability of failure, and it has very high scope of failure. So any single, you know, any single mistake in one place in this whole big thing that is your software will, can cause an out, you know, can cause something like that. Right, and even the best and the brightest, even Google, who can pour resources and resources and resources at solving those issues, still gets those. Right, so and this means that in software, it's um, it's almost it, it's very hard uh, to actually prevent failure. 
So whereas in FedEx you can build a nice process which prevents failure or minimizes its probability and then quickly rec recovers from, uh, the, you know, and then ensures basically against everything else, then in software we can't actually do anything like that. So something, something entirely different is needed. And I, I like to think that software, you know, in, in reality, if, like, when, when I have to explain what is software like to people who don't understand it, then, you know, I, I like to say that there's just a bunch of gremlins, you know, running around and, and basically pulling levers, and that, that's what it looks like. And if one gremlin gets sick, then, you know, he pulls the wrong lever, and that's the problem. So you have this giant, you know, enormous amount of, if, if you try to reproduce software in, in the physical world, you get this enormous amount of moving parts, which would be, you know, the most complicated machine you could ever imagine, and then it's not much surprising that it breaks from time. And then, and then the, you know, this machine has changed all the time, so it's not much surprising that it breaks quite often. Um, so, the, the, you know, the question is, how do we fix this? And recently, uh, and yeah, and, and the, key, the key problems that we want to fix is actually uh, kind of two, two-faced issue. The biggest one is failure. So the, the biggest question is always, uh, in software, because failure scope and failure probability is so high that the biggest question is always um, how can we either prevent failure or how can we recover from failure or if neither of those are possible, how we can detect and fix, you know, how we can detect and react to failure quickly, right? So there's kind of three different paths uh, that we can go to. And the other problem is that, you know, because um, we actually... We, you know, because again, so, so this is kind of this one problem, which is that we have this big moving machine and we want to be able to fix it quickly. But the other problem is that we also need to, you know, change that machine on the fly, right? So we need to somehow swap out the parts, put some parts back in, and so that the users won't notice a thing, right? And this is also, and this, and, and, and also, and, and these two problems actually impact to get each other quite much because failure produces downtime, you know, and uh, downtime is, uh, and very often the update, the changing the machine is what produces failure. So this is all kind of entangled. So the question is, you know, how do we, how do we manage to, um, how can we fix those issues? And the solution that's recently been uh, mostly uh, got the most focus is continuous delivery. So uh, continuous delivery basically has kind of this philosophy where we try to make everything as predictable and trackable as we can. Uh, and we also uh, try to make, you know, uh, we also try, to, so, so, you know, we automate everything, right? This is kind of, so, so everything is as predictable as it possibly can. So we try to eliminate, either eliminate or isolate human error, which is, you know, the most common uh, cause of failure still in, in, in everything. Uh, we record everything, we track everything so that if something does fail, it would have a, you know, we'd have a breadcrumb trail so that we could go back by it and we could figure out what, what is going on. You know, not just one stack trace, but actually uh, meaningful, meaningful data. Um, we test, and the most interesting thing, the most uh, coolest thing I like about kind of philosophy of continuous delivery, that there becomes less and less difference between test and monitoring. So monitoring is just, you know, a type of test you do in production, right? And very often it's the same test suite, if you have a test suite, which a lot of us still don't, but if you... Uh, and, uh, and that's, that's and, and production is actually treated as an ultimate test, right? So uh, one of the, you know, one of the philosophies of, one of this kind of underlying philosophy is that we embrace failure. So production is just the last test, you know, the last ultimate test. And that's why we do things like partial rollouts. That's why we do things like A-B testing. That's why we have to have sophisticated monitoring, which is basically same testing, right? Because we don't just need, we don't just need to know that the server pings. We actually want to know that the, uh, the software that is deployed there, it actually performs correctly, right? So the services that it exposes, for example, you know, they, they still work, they still respond, they still respond correctly. And, and, and so tests, tests and monitoring are getting closer and closer together. And finally, you know, we have recovery paths, which is very often it's just like, uh, you know, we can, we will be able to quickly fix something, but very often it's uh, also a real recovery path. So that's, that's something that we definitely will talk about. But as I said, this is not like a philosophy talk. Uh, this is a very pragmatic talk. So uh, starting from the next slide, we actually dive into the actual delivery pipeline. So uh, continuous delivery is basically about building a pipeline starting from your patches, which you commit into your version control system, all the way to release ready, uh, release candidate. So the interesting, uh, the interesting again, kind of uh, flavor is that um, 
continuous delivery does not require you to deploy anything. Uh, the only thing is typically what is required is that at any moment you have a release ready uh, candidate, right? So you identify which candidate, which, which builds are release ready, and basically at any moment somebody can come. And the second thing that is required that you can have a one button deploy, you know, of those release candidates, but there's no requirement that that one button would be pressed automatically. There, it, it, it can be, so this, you know, you can do that, but it's not, there's absolutely no, re, you know, there's usually no reason why you should start like that. Uh, most people are not comfortable pushing stuff into production automatically. Uh, most people they need to learn to trust their tests. They need to learn to trust their uh, environment. And um, but what is required is that you know we have a repository of builds which are production ready, right? And then a business guy comes and says, okay, I want those features in production now, and he can press a button. You know, and you can say, oh, those features are in those build. You, you can just deploy. You know, press this button and it deploys, right? So and uh, and that's how it should work. And so we, the pipeline, you know, this thing that actually delivers the patches to the production, uh, breaks down in three main uh, components, uh, which actually, you know, ma manage the pipeline. And then there's a few components like testing, monitoring, and uh, configuration management, which are kind of outside, outside the scope of this talk, which go more into this nitty gritty details. Um, but, uh, so orchestration platform is basically what, you know, what, uh, what manages uh, this, uh, the, but what actually uh, manages the logic of the pipeline, like when something moves where, what happens in each step, and uh, and does that. Uh, the delivery manager is uh, what manages your uh, servers, your applications, your environment, and the artifact repository is where you store your builds and where you promote your builds as they go through the pipeline. So uh, we start with the orchestration platform. So we're going to use Jenkins. It's if, if you're one of the 5% uh, of Earth's population that doesn't know what Jenkins is, then uh, we just did a survey and, and Jenkins is used in 70% of organizations. So, And uh, and second second is, I think, Atlassian Bamboo, which is used in 6%. So. <laughs> Sorry? It used to be Hudson. Well, I, I, you know, I, I don't want to get into that. You can use Hudson, you can use Jenkins as long as you... Uh, you know, you can use whatever you want. It's, it's, it doesn't even have to be Jenkins. Atlassian, Bamboo, Team City are also great alternatives. And uh, I just focus on Jenkins, uh, for, well, for reasons which I actually have, I think, on the next slide. Um, so Jenkins is our orchestration platform. Jenkins says what happens in what order, what are the conditions, and uh, actually executes a lot of scripts for us. Uh, it's kind of like, you know, it has a lot of this nice enterprise features, which is, around basically, you know, around basically scripting, right? So it's kind of scripting for the enterprise with nice charts and uh, all kind of stuff. And uh, and this is great. Uh, this is, uh, it's very uh, usable for that, but it does have some issues which we're also going to discuss. Uh, the second tool we're going to use is uh, Liverable, uh, which is our tool. Uh, so don't worry, it's not going to take a whole lot of the talk. But, uh, you know, and, and the uh, main reason so it's a commercial tool. Uh, there are some open source alternatives, I think. Well, uh, not 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 really. But uh, the reason why uh, we want to use uh, Liverable is uh, one because it's very well uh, supports the no downtime updates. Uh, it actually provides this failsafe uh, deliver and recovery, which is very nice. It ties into this uh, recover part of the philosophy that every every everything you do in Liverable is, is uh, reversible. It has wide ecosystem support, like it supports everything from Jetty to WebSphere, uh, and even NetWeaver, apparently, SAP NetWeaver. Uh, you get very good knowledge what's in production, and you can install it inside five minutes without any documentation. Uh, so, and uh, what we'll use it for is for deploying and deploying applications, for updating, for like production applications without downtime, uh, low sessions, and using either hot patching or plain old restarts. And uh, well, I did in places actually irrelevant here. So uh, here's we get to the reason why exactly Liverable is. There's actually, you know, not no no great open source alternatives. Uh, you have Cargo, Capistrano. Uh, you have um, uh, like container own bindings, which are usually, you know, you need to do a lot of work around them. They're they're not anywhere. They don't provide anywhere near as high level kind of this. You know, just update this application to that version. They they provide you. Uh, you know, if you have to usually, if, if you want to do this kind of no downtime rotation, then you have to do it either yourself or risk, or just use kind of redeployment and risk out of memory errors. 
And yeah, so, so the, and we also support the whole wide ecosystem, so you can use the same tool to manage all your uh, containers. And, you know, and we actually integrate with things like Jenkins, with uh, Bamboo, with a lot of Maven and so on, with other open source projects. So, uh, the final tool is Nexus, uh, which is, you know, which is an OSS and commercial artifact repository. Again, like, um, we use Nexus, uh, it, you know, an alternative is Artifactory, which is actually uh, a great, which is also a great repository, and there's a, um, th there's a talk, I think, tomorrow uh, from Baruch, uh, which, which actually is gonna talk about that repository, so you can, you know, if you're interested, you can attend. But for, for our purposes, there won't be a lot of difference, but uh, actually, Artifactory does have some uh, nice continuous delivery-oriented features, so which, which will make uh, some of the things we want to do much simpler. So, but not impossible to do. Well, it, it's, I guess, you know, you, you can do everything always in open source if you're just willing to, uh, willing to script a lot yourself. And um, so Artifactory just smooths the path for this. So, uh, you know, Nexus, on the other hand, uh, we use it because it basically manages uh, repositories. It's really easy to create dynamic, like kind of new repositories. Uh, since we're gonna create a bunch of them, it's uh, very good for us. And it also has some enterprise-y features around it. Okay, so that's it, that's, that's all the philosophy. Uh, it took about 15 minutes, a little bit, probably more than could be, but let's, let's now start with building the actual pipeline. So now it's, uh, the, rest, the rest of the 45 minutes is one big demo. <laughs> uh, and the pipeline we're gonna build, we, we'll build kind of like a partial uh, pipeline with four main stages, but these four stages uh, will actually uh, show almost everything uh, you need to build a bigger pipeline. So uh, one thing that is missing here is staging. You know, typically you have, besides testing QA, you also have like kind of this exact replica of a production environment, which is, uh, or near, near replica of a production environment, which is staging. And I guess, you know, you can have a lot more other stages as well. Um, so we, the environment we have uh, looks something like that. We have Jenkins, uh, which connects to Nexus and Liverable. So Liverable manages uh, three Tomcats. Uh, one of them is, um, one, one of them is uh, for testing deployments and two of them are for production deployments. Behind, uh, they are actually behind an Apache load balancer. And we have also three Redises which pack the three Tomcats. I, actually, I think I'm wrong, there's two Redises. Yeah. The, the, I, I used to have, because I used to have also staging, I used to have four Tomcats, but I dropped one Tomcat, so actually I dropped one Redis as well. So one, one Redis backs the testing and one Redis backs the production. And, uh, and the application uh, we're actually going to deploy, it's, a, it's kind of a, it, it's, a, it's a chat. It's a chat application. It's very nice because uh, you can nicely show, uh, demonstrate their failure and downtime, uh, you know, because it has a very nice user facing. It's distributed. It's, uh, so you get all these all this nice features, and, and it actually has some state. So you get, um, it, it's very good for such demonstrations. Of course, it's somewhat simple. Uh, so, you know, so I'll, I'll also try to give some anecdotal stories meanwhile uh, how, how things happen on the big apps. Right, uh, so first of all, so let's start with the build stage. Uh, so in the build stage, we're gonna do very, not, nothing much bad. We're gonna build the artifact and we're gonna upload it to the build repository. So very, very simple. So now let's go to the actual things. Uh, so I have everything running in the cloud environment. Uh, and uh, so, this is, uh, so this is Jenkins. And this is actually, you know, it actually contains the pipeline that we want to build. I'm gonna first build part of it and then we're gonna review the key aspects of the rest uh, because building the whole pipeline actually took me three weeks. So, <laughs> uh, well, uh, I guess rebuilding it from scratch now wouldn't take three weeks because I just had to solve so much issues while I was building it. But, uh, you know, but we don't want, it, it's still, one hour is not really enough uh, to go through, abs to, to build absolutely everything from scratch. So, uh, a cool thing in Jenkins is Jenkins has this uh, thing called Build Pipeline View. It's a plugin, and it actually allows you to see the whole pipeline, like in an overview. And unfortunately, for some reason, oh, okay, so it's, here we go. Uh, so, so it's, so it's a little bit long. We have, you know, we have a lot of steps. But I like to have it for overview because, for example, previously, you know, I tried to build something and it actually failed, and I see that it failed in the third step, right? And that's very nice. So it's 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 a very useful plugin for continuous delivery. Even though I later showed that we actually um, kind of quant use it, 
can't quite use it. That's but one of the biggest issues with Jenkins is that it has a lot of plugins. They're all awesome, but they all don't work with each other very well. So, so you know, some plugins, but but it provides it provides an overview at least, like you know what you have. If if it, if not necessarily, it provides an overview on like uh, what you know what you're gonna how it's gonna run. Uh, so second tool we use is Liveable. Uh, so Liveable is actually um, manages applications, uh, manages servers. So. I can show here that we have these three servers, one test and two production. I like test has, for example, right now two applications deployed, and production has one application deployed, and you know, in application-centric view, uh, we can basically uh, look at the applications. So actually, I don't need those applications, so I'm gonna delete them, but uh, so I'm just gonna undeploy those, the test ones, uh, because this was just the previous build that got left behind. So, and so we could start the service there. Okay, so now we have only one application left, which is production. You know, the one thing that Liveable uh, does pretty easily, you know, this is just a very, uh, just a demonstration, but we, we can, you know, we, we right now have a version B170, the latest is actually 172. So we can just go and, uh, you know, this is our kind of this, Trademark technology hot patching, which we use in Jarable, which we use in Liveable. And Liveable is uh, it's used in a very different way than it's used in Jarable, which means that it's 100% uh, safe uh, for production. Like we very like this upgrade is compatible for hot patching. Actually, uh, means that we uh, verified that you know that the changes here are all, are all compatible uh, to apply the hot patch. And so I can just press update. Production is updated now, so that's that, that's that's why I say that it's really easy to do non-doubt on updates. If you, you know, I challenge you to find a tool which lets you do it so easily. But let's uh, let's update it back. I don't actually care right now about that. I'm fine with having uh, 170 or even whatever. So I'll just bring it back. All servers are again updated. And the, ne the last tool we use is Sonotype Nexus. And uh, so this is actually where we start. So uh, the thing we do with Sonotype is that we create uh, the four repositories. And I'm sorry that the font is a little bit uh, small. Um, uh, but basically we create four repos repositories which correspond to the four stages of the uh, continue of, of our pipeline. So one repository per each stage. And the repositories will actually so one of the issues with Jenkins is that it's really hard to model uh, long-running uh, jobs in Jenkins, and it's actually, you know, using Jenkins to store distributed artifacts is generally not a great idea, but but on top of that, uh, just if we want to have long-running jobs, like for example, we want manual QA, then it's really hard to model that purely in Jenkins, and this is where repositories will help us very nicely. So you'll, you'll, you'll see how I use them, and, and I think it's, it's a very, um, it's, it's, you know, this is where, is having one repository per stage is gonna play right into that. All right, so, and here's also we have the Apache load balance which actually shows that we have two uh, Tomcats behind it. So, okay, so let's go back to Jenkins. And so just as a reminder, we're creating, a, first we create a build job uh, which builds the artifacts and forwards it to build repository. So, um, I'm doing a new job, calling it build, two, and I think I just want a freestyle. So uh, first thing we want to check out the source code. Uh, in our case, so I have somewhere, so in our case it's um, a local repository. It could be remote, it could be anywhere. I'm just using local because I'm gonna be updating it and it's just much easier for me if it's local. Well, it's not a lot easier actually, but I'll just need a temp repository somewhere publicly, which is the Y. <laughs> Cause I'm, I keep making like the changes there. Okay, so we do the checkout. Uh, then we do the uh, invoke top level Maven target. So for Maven, we're basically doing an install. And we pass on, uh, so we pass on the build number. And this is exactly as I said that, you know, instead of producing a snapshot, the version that is produced by the Maven build is just the, you know, the, the version number is basically B and the build number, right? So build number is an environment variable of Jenkins, which is gonna be expanded to the actual number of this build. So, so the, the basically in Jenkins, uh, Jenkins like sets environment variables for you, just usual kind of this 
you know, bash style environment variables. And there's, if you just search for Jenkins environment variables, you're gonna find a list of them. And then in any script, you can use them. All right, so build, build number is a standard environment variable which expands to the, the actual number of the build, right? So starting from one and up to infinity. Well, yeah, so, so, so the, 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 way, the way I do here is that I pass on like minus D is this property. And then basically that property in Maven, you know, is undefined. And, but the, in the version, in the project version, I use that property, right? So that property is actually expanded to this expression. Yeah, inside the point file. And, I, I, and, and so the, the interesting thing is I did that originally, and uh, the way I later structured the build, it's not even that necessary anymore. But, uh, but th that's, you know, that's uh, one way, that's certainly one way to do that if you wanna be consistent. And, uh, and so the next thing, okay, so the next thing I'm creating a text file, so let's see. So uh, remember, oh, I don't even want the Maven, I want just the, last time I wasn't, wasn't actually doing that until later, but um, remember I said that, that one, one of the philosophies of, um, of continuous delivery is that we record everything. And there's all kind of fancy ways to record it, but I found that one way uh, to do that is just to produce a simple text file where you dump kind of the most important uh, steps you're doing and the most important, uh, you know, uh, descriptions about uh, uh, what you, um, about what, what are you doing, and you attach it like through, through the whole pipeline, you kind of thread it through the whole pipeline and attach it all the way to production, right? So that, uh, so that for every application that you have deployed, for every application at every step, they actually can, you know, if something fails, you can go back and find out like what was it built from, like what exactly the version, what happened to it, like what was, you know, what, what tests failed, what tests didn't fail. So, and that's why, you know, and, 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 and using a text file, it's actually very, very easy to do that. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't go inside the artifact. So the problem is that you can, like the reason why you cannot put it inside the artifact is that uh, it's gonna keep changing, right? We're gonna keep adding to it, uh, to, the, to the actual text file, right? Because it's gonna go through many steps, but we don't want to change the artifact. You know, we build the artifact in the first step, and that's it, we never, you know, the artifact never changes from that moment. It is a second artifact, yeah. So uh, I'll, I'll show you, but basically we're going to, uh, to deploy it uh, with the, well, well I'm, I'm, <laughs> that's the next thing actually, so, uh, so if we, so the next, I don't know, here it's, so if you look here, we're doing this deploy file, right? Uh, we're saying which repository to deploy to, and we're going to the build repository. So um, this CD, is, it's only for password basically, it's uh, not relevant. So the file is this build artifact. And then we also attach the build text, the build text, and we basically say that the classifier is the build notes, right? And uh, and uh, I think there's also should be some a type, but and then it goes all this man. And here I said that the previous one was almost irre irrelevant because again we give the version here. The only reason that why we, we uh, why it's reasonable to give the, uh, to put the version inside the actual form XML is if you have something in the build, you know, which, the, like, if you display, for example, somewhere the version in your application, then it's reasonable uh, to also pass it to PomXML because everything else you can do here. Uh, well, somewhere I think there was build notes, I think. I kind of feel that there was supposed to be a minus D type. But it's funny that I can't find it. Oh, there it is, okay, I just, I just missed it. Yeah, so type, so type is text. Classifier is build notes, and it's going to attach like the way Maven does it. it you know, we we're going to run it in a second actually, so there's no need to. Okay, so we have the build, and it's actually complete. So let's just uh, run it. It should run very quickly, and let's see what happens. What what the artifact will look like? So it's a completely new artifact. Ooh, one one thing I am worried about is that actually it's probably going to fail. Uh, let's see. It failed, and the reason why it failed is because we already have an artifact B, B1, so in Maven you cannot up upload the artifact twice. So what I actually should do is, I, uh, here I should rename it uh, to something else. So because I already used A, then I think I'll use C now. So, if we just use C, then everything should be fine. Let's try again. Uh, 
Um, I, th I think there is. I think you can define variables in Jenkins. Um, well, but I mean, one of the, for me, one of the biggest issues with Jenkins is kind of this lack of first class things, right? So you kind of define a function, like everything is kind of copy pastable, and this is, this is a pain in the ass, actually. <laughs> Maintaining Jenkins, like, basically the best solution, like, I was talking to guys at Netflix, and the best solution that people has come up with is that they have a DSL for generating Jenkins jobs, right? So they generate them on disk, and, but this is like, you know, debugging that is horrible, right? So it's, it's, that's, that's why I said the Jenkins, you know, it's kind of the best we have, but it's not great. Yeah, okay, so we, we built the thing, uh, it succeeded, and if we go to the repository, uh, to the build repository, uh, refresh it, uh, then we should nicely have the, all right, can you drag this up? Yeah. I don't know why Nexus persists in using this. So C2, here's the artifact, right? So here's the war, here's the descriptor, and here's the build notes right here. And if we download them, uh, then, you know, we, 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 we see that here's the change set, here's the uh, Jenkins job that built it, you know, and here's the log, right? So we already have, well, at least know where to start searching, like what, what, what you know, what, what patch created this, and we can track it right back uh, to where it came from. Okay, so uh, build, uh, now let's, uh, let's add two more jobs, and those two jobs will deploy a test environment, and then we'll run a test against it, and uh, you know, once we're finished with those, we'll actually, we'll review the rest of them. Uh, so now, now we're gonna uh, build the test stage. There'll be two jobs. Uh, one of them is going to download the build artifact and create the new test deployment, and the other one is going to run acceptance test, and then uh, uh, upload the test artifact. So. Uh, nothing terribly complicated, but uh, still pretty hairy at places. So let's just uh, create one more uh, job, which is the uh, deploy test two. Uh, deploy test two. Test two. Why not? Uh, again, a freestyle. So, and what we want to do is first uh, download. So first, download the previous artifact. Uh, so interestingly, I, uh, interestingly enough, uh, for download. Or for deploy, you know, I, um, uh, let's see, let's use it, I guess, better. So for deploy, I could use just deploy, deploy file. For download, when I don't, don't do this uh, whole expansion of the Maven, you know, uh, this kind of plugin thing, it just fails. And I, I don't understand why maybe get is somehow differently defined than deploy, but uh, it was one of those things which just fail, and I, I, I don't care enough to start figuring out why. It's easier to just expand it. So, and so, uh, get, hmm? Ooh, thank you, very nice. So, uh, let's put the C for build number. Um, and no notice that the, uh, notice that the no name is now different. It's not build number, it's source build number. And the reason is that we don't want to use the, like uh, Jenkins has a separate build number for every job, but what we actually want to use is the build number of the original job. So we're gonna actually thread it through all the jobs, which is a pain in the ass, but uh, with Jenkins, because you, you know, it, it, like, again, like, I, I haven't figured out how to define, like, a global something for the whole variable. And you'll, like, you'll see why it's, it's pretty hard, because some of the parts are manual, and, and that's kind of a tough. So this source build number, uh, the, when the build job finishes, you know, when it triggers the next job, it's gonna pass it along. And so so w w when we put the jobs together, I'll, I'll show how to do that. Uh, so this is again, so the cool part about dependency get is that starting I think from Maven 2.1 or something, uh, pretty recently it has this minus D test where you can actually download the artifact where you want it to be. Before it was, <laughs> before it actually was very, very hard to do that, right? But now you can just download it here, so, so that's pretty easy. Um, and, and we also will download the build.txt, so it's also here. And uh, now we'll just use Liverable. Sorry? Uh, right you are, my friend. Let's... Very good. I love it when my audience debugs for me. It's awesome. Yeah, here it was, yes, okay. And, uh, you know, and we'll use uh, Liverable uh, to manage our uh, test environment as well. So I'll just use a Jenkins job. Uh, we'll use the same um, we'll use this 
our demo war. Here we go. I will provide our own uh, versioning. Um, so a cool thing about, like I said, like Liverable also supports this associating metadata with something. So it's actually going to be visible in Liverable when you click. Like all all the logs will be there. Um, and uh, but what we want actually is uh, we want. So again, I'm going to change it to C. Uh, but the point is that we we want to deploy a separate application because uh, we want to have. You know, in test, we want one deployment per version because we, we might have many version parallelly tested, right? It's not like, it's not like production. We have one version at a time, but it's exactly, we have a new environment for each, uh, for each build. So uh, we're gonna just use the application name for that and also the context path. So each, each is gonna get the unique context path and unique name, yes? It's faster. Because that's going to be a bottleneck. Um, you have no guarantee. Like, um, so it, it, this is true. In, like, uh, it's actually not true even in production. But for release candidate, candidate, typically you will go with the last, you know, release candidate that passed the pipeline. Uh, while they pass the pipeline, since you don't, you, the, like each, each part of the pipeline is a bottleneck, and you don't actually know which releases will succeed and which will fail. So you want to, you know, you usually want to uh, run as many in, in parallel as you want, especially if you have manual testing, which I'll show uh, next. So, you know. Well, okay, so, so, okay, so, so here's, <laughs> okay, so here's, you know, uh, another, another thing you could, Okay, you could do that. You could just throttle the build so that you would have one build at a time running, and you just you know. But it, it's just gonna like if if it if it works for you, that's fine. I don't mind that. But typically, it will just bottleneck there. Like you know, typically you can test a lot more if you have parallel deployments, and you know that's that's uh, typically it's better. So uh, uh, for update, we're just gonna use the offline restore update, or it's actually it's gonna automatically hot patch if everything is compatible, and then fall back to offline update because we don't have don't don't. I, I actually here it's. Here's there's no update. Sorry, what I was thinking. Here's just we deploy a new application, then we just clean it up at some point. So don't listen to me. And we're going to deploy it to the test server. So uh, so that's that's pretty easy. Uh, save it, and now we also add a test. So that's uh, the last job we're going to go through in detail. Automatic test two again a freestyle. So, and automatic tests actually uh, should create now a test.txt. Uh, uh, so there, there's a good reason why I'm calling them differently. Uh, oh, uh, that's actually, sorry, <laughs> that was wrong. Uh, so, so, okay, so let's start, uh, let's start by downloading the previous one actually, download the previous log, uh, uh, and then we, and then we basically, you know, th this is a placeholder for real tests. I I'm just using wget. So I'm, I'm just using wget against a specific place. And, you know, and, and oh, the, the previous I forgot, okay. So, um, choo, choo, choo. God, this is uncomfortable. Um, uh, so, so yeah, so, so the reason why it's called text, te te test text is that we actually, on every stage, we need to accordingly rename the uh, Maven classifier, uh, because otherwise, uh, I first gave the same name, like this build notes to everything, uh, but it turns out that when you download it to the local repository, they're gonna collide, and then you're gonna have really weird problems. So actually, for every stage, the classifier has to be different. So, uh, but anyway, we just do a wget, and uh, if it passes, then we write automated test pass. And if that and if it's all good, then we just upload uh, upload the artifact to the next repository. So again, I'll change P to C. So the next repository is actually uh, sorry, now I'm confused. Oh, this is still get. So we download. Yes, we first download that This is the curse, like that we don't have a promote. We have to download, and then we have to upload. So, and then we actually upload it to the new repository, so. 
this one actually. Right here, so first of all, uh, like I said, classifier is test nodes now, not build nodes. The classifier changed, and also the repository is now test. So, so test repository along with the test nodes and the artifact. All right, so that's it. Okay, uh, so now let's connect those three jobs. We have three disjoint jobs, and the way you connect them uh, is that basically. Um, the, the, so there are two ways to connect them. One is that uh, you, in the kind of the next job, you set up that it's triggered when the previous one is finished. And the other way is that you know you kind of imperatively in the end of the first job trigger the next one. So imperatively, it's better if you want to pass parameters around, uh, because otherwise the other job cannot grab the parameters anyhow. So uh, what we basically say is that we trigger a parameterized build. Uh, the, the next project, uh, one of the nice things and I say nice without, you know, with a lot of sarcasm and Jenkins is that it all the time confuses the words jobs and projects. Uh, sometimes they're projects and sometimes they're jobs. And for me, it's like very, very different things. Um, and we just add this source build, build number, sorry, equals build number. So, okay, so and uh, for the next one, it's actually now easier. So for deploy test two, uh, we don't anymore have to add parameters uh, because deploy test two, uh, we can actually just say trigger parameter as built and just uh, use the current build parameters. So th at least that's, that is nice. Uh, all right, see? And now finally we can also add a uh, new view, which is the build pipeline view. So we'll call it pipeline two, demo pipeline two. And we say that the first, so you, you just specify the first job, which is uh, build two, and then it basically finds everything else. It finds these triggers. And so it looks like this. All right, so that took a lot of time, as everything with Jenkins does, but we have a pipeline, so let's build something. So that's um, gonna take a few uh, minutes more. And, and you know, and, and this basically, you know, there's three things. Uh, building a small pipeline kind of gives you the main idea how to give, build a bigger one, but we're gonna stop on a few key uh, things like how to do manual. Uh, so how, how to, main, main, one more main thing I wanna stop is how to do, how to incorporate manual act activities, like for example, QA, production deployment into this pipeline. This is a very interesting problem, and I think, you know, we, we, I, I think I found a way how to do it fairly nicely. So th this actually, sh uh, the automatic test actually right now should fail, uh, because I have the version that should be failing, just so that we could check that our pipeline is actually doing anything. I, do, I just wish that with Jenkins, well, one of the reasons, I guess, is that it's also in the cloud. Cloud is not super, Amazon Cloud is not, known for uh, being super fast, especially if you're doing anything with I.O. So let's look at this. So uh, let's just check how things worked. So it failed. Uh, it failed with an error of 500. And if we look at Liberable, uh, then actually, like this new version has been deployed, right? So, and that, that is, and we, we can even look at the place where it's deployed, I think. And here, here's the metadata as well. So all, all the metadata went to the build. And let's just try to, I don't know if this will work, but if I copy the link address and then replace this with that CD demo. Yeah, I didn't even show the chat, chat application. You know, it's, it's not horribly relevant. But the important part is that there are no smileys in the chat, because the last part of the demo will be actually that we'll update production and add, add smileys. It's a huge feature, very important, lots of state. Anyway, um, so now, now we have uh, actually, yeah, so the, the, ver the, the test version is deployed, so I'll build, but I'll build is in passing. So now, um, so now I'm going to the uh, wrong place, actually.
So now I'm going to the right place, to the repository, uh, logging up the log. Just named very badly, but let's look at 19. Yeah, so this is something we should back up. Yeah, so, okay, uh, no, that's right. Uh, uh, strange, strange. Okay, no, I'll, I'll just edit it manually. It's easier. Oh yeah, with diff I have to specify two versions. I keep forgetting that. Like minor server and you have to specify the two versions, otherwise it just gives you pretty much the diff from the current one. So that's not not what I want, but uh, okay, right now I just uh, want this. Sir? Uh, the, cha the change I made is basically, uh, oh, sorry, that's, uh, so that's Mercurial. That's uh, that's basically Git. Git is Git, and Mercurial is HG. So it's you know it's like SVN. It's, uh, I'm just I'm just checking in a change uh, so that uh, so that I could use uh, so basically so my chest could pass. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, run the build, and because I don't want to uh, waste a lot of time on that, so it should pass now. Uh, meanwhile, we can go into uh, the rest of stuff. So uh, okay, so we did the build, we did test, we have a test artifact now in the repository. Everything is good so far. So next is QA, and QA we're gonna do in a nice way that we actually incorporate manual QA, and the way we're gonna do is that we're gonna send an email which contains the environment and contains a uh, link which QA will click, which will actually say that the test is successful. And you know, and theoretically also contains a link which says that the test failed, but actually hasn't done that link, but it's really, really easy to do it. So let, let's see how, how do we do that. Uh, it turns out that it's not terribly uh, complex, so, uh, so if you, you know, if we look back at the full demo pipeline, then after build, deploy, test, and automatic test, the next job is begin QA. Uh, let's look at that. So begin QA, uh, first of all, downloads the, again, the uh, wrongly named build TXT here, but doesn't matter, it's just a file name. But the point it downloads it from the test, uh, it downloads the test nodes from the test repository. Um, and after that, basically we send an email. So the email goes to, you know, basically it should be a QA list or issue tracker or something, uh, which can handle an email. And it just says that we're beginning QA for uh, version this. So here's a uh, nice, nice, okay, this actually is B. <laughs> so here's a nice thing in Jenkins that uh, the a way to say, specify an environment variable in the email plugin, which is called, uh, it's actually called email ext, the plugin that allows you to do that. But the way to expand environment variables is completely different from everywhere else. Uh, after you, of course, there's no documentation. So, you know, uh, it took me quite a few hours to find that. Uh, and you have to say this env and then var equals source build number. But at least once you found that out, it works. So, and what, you, what we send is like a link to the environment, right? We just uh, say QA that this is the application you need to test. And as you know, remember we deployed a unique environment for every build, so here's where it comes very much in handy. <laughs> and uh, the second thing we do is that we send this, uh, we send this uh, another link which says that please test it thoroughly and if successful, click on this link. And the link actually goes back to Jenkins and uh, does this thing QA success build with parameters. So here, there's a very cool feature in Jenkins which I really much like, which is like one of the, one of the coolest things there is is that if you, if, you want to, uh, if you want to script something in Jenkins, all you have to do is add the word API in the end, and it takes you to a page you know, where there's API specific to this place. Right? So this API is specific to the uh, QA success job, and you know, there's XML, JSON, Python, but also if you just want to, uh, if you just want to perform a build, uh, then you can just post to this URL, and if the build has parameters, you post to that URL. Right? So all we have to do is post to that URL, and we can also add any parameters we want. 
And, you know, and that's what we're doing. We're basically saying that, uh, here we're saying the QSSS and, and strut the build, and for this source, build number, right? So we pass along the build number, and what the QA success will do is actually it uh, does very little. It basically promotes uh, promotes the uh, the build further, right? And uh, the only the only caveat here is that for QA success or like for any job that access accepts uh, this uh, link build with parameters API, you have to define this checkbox that this build is parameterized, and if you don't, nothing will work. So for every for all the triggers, it will work without it, but if you use the API, you have to do that. Uh, that's just, you know, niceness. Uh, that's one of those nice things that Jenkins does for you, that everything is done differently. So, um, okay, so this, as I said, this doesn't do anything really. It just downloads a QA and says that manual tests have passed because we assume that the guys, you know, if we, if we want to do it cooler, we actually can do a very small web application, you know, kind of like, and we, instead of sending an email, we can do a REST post to that application. You know, on this application, for example, the testers can, uh, can also add comments and, for example, add issues, you know, which were created from this, right? And then, then we have more information in the log. We can put that all back in the log. So there's, you know, it's very, very this kind of, it's, it's easy to do this kind of integration because we have the repository which holds the artifact and we just need to pass on the build number and we can just continue on. So that's, that's why I said that the repository kind is this long running sync point. So we have libraries on the repository which, which do, do this long running sync points. Well, J Jenkins itself is not very good at that. All right, and then we basically uh, uh, also get the, so and, and then we basically deploy uh, the uh, artifact to the next repository. Again, this is QA notes now, not test notes, not build notes, and the repository is also QA. So we pass the build and we, we record that nicely. And uh, next we actually run cleanup test, uh, which uh, doesn't do anything terribly smart. Uh, it basically deletes uh, deletes this environments which we created previously. So one, one of the things this pipeline actually doesn't do, and I keep forgetting about that, keep forgetting to add it as well, is we actually need another link in the QA, either another link or we need an automated job which runs and get, cleans up those environments after three, you know, after a few, some time has passed, otherwise you just keep accumulating them. So, but, uh, you know, deleting an environment with Liverable, uh well, the, the Jenkins plugin doesn't support that, but there is a command line uh, which is very easy to use and uh, which I'm basically, you know, saying here, uh, using here. So, um, so it's, it's a very short job. It just has one shell which deletes the environment. All right, the next, the final interesting job is begin deploy production. And I know that we're slowly running out of time here. So begin deploy production basically uh, works similar way that for every, for every build that made it so far, we want to send an email or post a rest or something. And basically, you know, or even, you know, you can even have a big red physical button, you know, which just basically does the last release. But, uh, but basically this, this says that okay, this, uh, tell, I, you know, here I just send an email and again just say that, you know, here's the link you should click. But it can also be a rest post, it can also be whatever, as long as basically escaping Jenkins now and now we're waiting for manual input. Right, the manual input is very easy from the point that for you it's just, again, it's rest, rest call back into Jenkins, or you can even directly do a rest call into library below a scripting call, so, and, and there you can script in Jenkins as well. So e either way, it's easy. And, um, and oh, by the way, one thing I didn't show is that for QA and for RC as well, we, in this email we also include as attachment the whole log. And this is again, for example, in QA, you know, you want the guys to find who do they blame, right? Who do they assign issues for? And it makes it really easy because all the log is with it, right? And same for production, you want to, if, if there's, you know, if you want to ask somebody about it, there, there, it's really easy to do so. All right, and uh, so that's, uh, that's pretty much it. The last thing is deploy production, it's the last job. So, uh, and it basically downloads things now from the QA, uploads things to RC, so, uh, there's nothing terribly interesting. And the last uh, thing it does is uses Liverable uh, and actually, you know, um, so deploys a new version of the build. And this happens only if somebody actually clicks on the link. And so uh, it will again, it will do compatibility check and use hot patching if it's compatible or fall back, like in this case, to rolling restart, which is basically uh, this uh, automatically rolling restart with a session drain. And li Liverable ha handles it automatically because it kind of cr creates its own uh, load balancing for the time of the update so that you don't have uh, to worry about anything like that. 
Anyway, um, so now let's uh, finish up here. I'm just gonna start the build. So I, actually, I'm just gonna add a motion con, start a build, and then we'll finish uh, the talk. So I think it was very confused, but I think number uh, Is it me or is they all the same? Okay, am I doing something very wrong? No, I, I, no, I want them to add, uh, I want them to add emoticons, I'm not sure. Uh, so, okay, I'll just try it. Fine. Okay, 11 actually, I can do it back for 11. Uh, we'll do the motion cons, yes. Yeah, okay, so we have all the GIFs, very good. All right, okay. Good. All right, so uh, just to open production. This is the last demo and also finishing up. So right now there's no motion guns. I'm gonna start the build. It should also spam me meanwhile. So actually I should open my email and hope that there's nothing too bad there. Uh, and meanwhile, let's finish up the talk. So while the build is building. Okay, so we built the QA, incorporated all the manual stuff. Uh, we built the production, also incorporated all the manual stuff. And the idea in continuous delivery is that actually the business guys decide you know, when deployment happens, you know, which in reality, I, I, I don't, I, I still don't really understand what it means, like, because business guys can mean very, you know, but, but basically it's the guys who, you know, it's the guys who know how much we win from the feature. The point is that, you know, developers, uh, they don't care about go to market so much as they should maybe, but it's basically the guy who cares that this feature goes through, who actually, you know, gets, somehow gets the benefit from this feature going to production Right, so he should be making uh, the decision that it actually goes to production. So he should be taking the responsibility. In reality, you know, again, I'm pragmatic, so just as long as it happens, it's good. Um, things that we didn't cover is database uh, configuration environment and test and monitoring. Each three of them, you know, we could do a talk about each three. They're fairly complicated. Let's see if I got an email. Uh, not so far. Um, so now, now, now if we go back to the questions we asked in the beginning, you know, we have an answer to absolutely each and everyone. So we have this predictable pipeline where things are packaged, tested, and deployed in a, in a, in a repeatable way, right? So, and we, we try to, you know, we try to have the survival of the features where if, if, if a patch is good, then it actually goes all the way uh, to production. Um, and if it's bad, then, you know, then it's stopped earlier. And so we have this, uh, we have this quality release candidates accumulating. Um, so if we took, talk about conclusions, then, uh, you know, Jenkins basically creates the workflow. Things to remember, uh, Nexus is your sync point for long running process and also your validation point so that you are sure that you didn't, uh, you know, uh, make mistakes because you're trying to download the artifact and if the previous step didn't succeed, then there's no artifact, right? Uh, if you want manual flows, uh, they're pretty easy to script with either email, REST, or whatever you want. Uh, tracking on a basic level can be very nicely done with just scripting and text files. And if you want no downtime updates in a very easy way, uh, then you can do that with Liveable. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm anyway out of time, so thank you very much for attending. And, uh, you know, have fun with the conference.